Our next talk for today is from Gillian York. She's from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and she's going to tell us about how your body is a honeypot. How do we love in the 21st century, and how do we express this in our existing world? Giving the word to Julian, please. Woo! A round of applause. Hello. All right. Um, so I'm here today, as you said, to talk about um, ubiquitous surveillance and capture. And this is not at all, it's not entirely a depressing talk, although a little bit of the information is, of course. Uh, so this title came from the um, original time where I gave this talk, which was last year at Republika in Berlin, uh, where the theme was Love Out Loud. And when we were thinking about what kind of talk to submit, um, I was thinking about what it means to, to try to love or live out loud, um, to try to live you know, flamboyantly, excitedly, um, the way that we might if we were not being chased by cameras. In a time where um, you know, I'm thinking about where I'm from, the US, um, where my actions on the street can get me in trouble depending on who I am. Um, and so, yeah, that's where the, the idea came from initially. And so, I just opened my notes. There we go. Cool. So, facial recognition technologies are surrounding us more and more in our everyday lives, from the retrofitting of CCTV cameras to the ways that uh, social networks and other online um, activities are capturing information, data about our bodies, about our faces, and comparing them to existing databases. And so there's a combination of data. There's this data that we're handing over voluntarily to the social networks and other things that we take part in. But then there's also data that's being captured without our consent, um, both when we're walking on the street or when we're using uh, different websites, et cetera. And so when you put all of this together, our actions capture on film paint a startling complete picture of our lives. The same action that's captured through different lenses can lead to different conclusions, and there's a different motive behind every lens. And as I said, there's this data that we're giving over volu oh, sorry. <laughs> there's data that we hand over voluntarily, of course. The data that's captured from us, ah, sorry, I'm just having trouble with the slides. Ah, okay, cool. Thank you for being patient with me. <laughs> so ubiquitous surveillance is being rolled into consumer products and new technologies, and they're being pioneered by nation states and corporate actors alike. But as more and more of these interconnect interconnected systems emerge, our lives are increasingly under a microscope. There are now intimate pictures of our lives that are accessible to those who control technologies, but because of the various corporate players inside of the market and the variety of services that we use, there's um, on the one hand, there's this piecemeal view piecemeal view of our lives visually, but then when you combine it with the other data that companies have collected us about us, collected about us, sorry, um, this startling complete but also asymmetric or biased picture of our lives comes into focus. And so I think that we need to be asking some questions about this. First is who creates the technology and who benefits from it, and then of course who should have the right to collect and use information about our faces, our bodies, ourselves. So I'm going to use an example here. Ah, sorry. There we go. So this is just a funny example. Does anyone remember this website? Did I hear of me? Yes? Ooh, thank you. So this was just something that Microsoft put out there a couple of years ago. It was howold.net, and it was just a little test where you would upload a photo, and this um, algorithm would try to tell you how old you look. And so I remember uploading this myself and being told from a picture when I was 25 years old that I looked 40. So already I was pretty angry at this. But then I learned a little bit more about this particular product, and it's really interesting. So what happened was really, this was a mach an, uh, an experiment in machine learning, a website that can guess the age and gender of faces in a photograph. But the creators of the demonstration had actually been hoping to just lure in a few people, a few members of the public to test the software. But in, in reality, within hours, the site was actually struggling to remain online because it was being inundated with thousands of people from all over the world. 
And so there was another one really similar to this that launched last July. Um, this was not by Microsoft. I think it was by a company called uh, Face. It was called Face My Age. Um, I don't remember the company that was behind it. But like Microsoft's, or unlike Microsoft's experiment, it would ask its users to supply information such as their marital status, their educational background, whether they were a smoker or not, and to upload photographs of their face without a smile, without any makeup, um, in order to kind of try to figure out ex like other elements of that person. So they would try to guess the age, and they would try to guess the, or, sorry, not try to guess the age, um, they, were, they were basically, they were essentially creating this database. And so they said that they have a different specific model of aging for each gender, each ethnicity. So for example, they said women tend to age faster than men because their skin is different. And so essentially what this project was doing was just capturing an abundance of data without actually telling users what it was being used for, but people found it fun and so they participated in it. And I think that that's part of what's alluring about this. There are all these exciting sites, people, young people in particular, get lured into these things and they don't realize the information that they're handing over. And so let me use another example that I think will tell a little bit of a different story. Um, has anyone heard of Vikontakta? It's a Russian social network. Yeah. So it's a huge Russian social network. It has something like uh, 410 million users. Um, that's a lot of people, of course. And so there was this uh, app that came out a couple years ago called FindFace. It's a face recognition app that allows end users to compare a photograph to different profile photos on Vikontakta. And so unlike other facial recognition technology, FindFace's algorithm allows quick searches in their big data sets. So <laughs> what's interesting about this is there was this artist a couple years ago in St. Petersburg, and he really saw the concern in this particular app ahead of time. And so what he did was he would photograph people in the subway, put their photos into FindFace, and run them against this database. And he had a really pretty considerable success rate in figuring out who individuals were. So FindFace is able to identify users' faces with more than 70% accuracy. This is huge. Um, and so one of their founders has actually said that, <laughs> he said it looks for similar people as well. You could just upload a photo of a movie star that you like or your ex and then find 10 girls who look similar to her and send them messages. Um, I don't like the way that this is going. He's essentially saying that like, look, you can, he's already talking about the different ways that you can use his app for nefarious purposes. Um, and we've also already seen ways in which this is being used for nefarious purposes. So not just the subway test, that was just an artist, but uh, there was a report last year that said that FindFace was actually being used in Russia to identify and harass women who were acting in pornographic films. Um, so essentially, like it was this uh, right-wing group that was, uh, I think, even religiously oriented um, that was using this database taking images, screenshots of women in pornographic films, running them against the database, identifying them, and then outing them. So that's just a couple of the first examples, but I want to get a little bit deeper into the facial recognition technology. Let me just take a sip of my drink. There we go. Because what's really, what we're seeing is a murky kind of connection between who builds the technology, who creates the databases, and who benefits from all of it. There's this kind of triangular system happening between capitalism, government control, and then of course, who benefits. And in this case, it's not always clear who benefits. A lot of times we're seeing these public-private partnerships between these software, te uh, these technology companies, the software that they're building, and the governments that are hiring them to do this. And of course, it's not always governments, but those lines are indeed being increasingly blurred. So I put a few slides together that I just thought were interesting, these facial recognition technologies. Um, you know, you might expect that the branding on these, because of the way that they're marketed, uh, typically to con not to um, sort of end users or individual consumers, but to companies, to casinos, to banks, to the people who uh, the companies that want to use facial recognition technology to sort of capture the bad guys, you would think that the branding would kind of match that. But in reality, what we see across these is this design aesthetic that's being used by a host of facial recognition technologies that shows happy, smiling faces, and often the faces of women. So here's one, this is Sitecorp. 
Um, Sitecorp offers, according to their own website, they offer robust and cross-platform face analysis technologies for individual and crowd monitoring applications. And so they're basically allowing development kits that allow mobile app, user, uh, mobile app developers to use smartphone cameras to detect users' emotions. Uh, so facial analysis um, to determine emotion, as well as to determine age, gender, um, mood, and attention. And then they also offer another tool called Insight, which offers eye tracking alongside emotion recognition. Here's another company called Kairos. Remember this one? I'm going to come back to it in a little bit because there was some interesting news about it yesterday. So Kairos is a facial recognition technology uh, that has face analysis algorithms that can recognize and understand how people feel in videos, photos, in the real world. Um, and they use the example in their products of banks, as I mentioned before. So the idea of using facial recognition technology for a bank teller to be able to kind of get a notification that um, from the, the camera that's kind of doing emotional analysis on a customer, essentially to be able to determine whether or not that customer is going to do something bad, to rob the bank, to you know, put a gun to them, something like that. But one of the things that I thought when I heard that was, is this functionally taking away our autonomy? Um, what about circumstances where a customer is merely anxious or ha you know, has like, anxiety on a daily basis for some other reason? Um, if we're having a bad day, could we, we actually be refused from accessing our own bank account? Um, so I think these are some of the questions that we should be asking as we go forward. And now here's another one. This is Megvi. It's a Chinese developer of facial recognition technology. It's raised at least $100 million so far. Um, and they're working with Ant Financial, which is a, also a Chinese company, on a system allowing users to set up bank accounts online through facial scans. Um, and the idea there is, of course, that in countries where that data already exists, where the government has that kind of uh, biometric information about you that has your face, you could essentially use this product or use this, um, sorry, the company using this product would basically enable you to sign up for different services like banking accounts just by facial recognition. Um, and I think that that's kind of scary as well. They say that they don't compromise privacy because neither a user nor the company can see uh, the data, but I'm not so sure. Um, and then here's another one, Cognitech. They develop market-leading face recognition technology and applications for facial image database search and real-time video screen screening. Um, and essentially, what they're doing is uh, gender detection, age estimation, um, and right now what their products are used by Macau casinos, so casinos in the territory of Macau. Um, I think that the gender detection, this is kind of a side note, but I think the gender detection concept is really interesting because we've just reached a time in our society where we're thinking differently about gender. Um, and then here come all of these products, a lot of them coming in from China saying, okay, we're going to allow you to detect gender. So what do they mean when they say that? What are their, are they working on a gender binary? Um, I'm, I'm sure they are. <laughs> and if they are, what sort of determinants are they using to try to do that? Could that out a person who is not uh, necessarily out about being trans, for example? Um, again, I think that these are questions that we need to ask as well. And like many new technologies, these companies are, or like many new technologies like this, rather, um, these companies are testing their technologies uh, in places like countries in Africa, Southeast Asia, uh, places where a lot of times the regulations are not as strict as, say, in Europe. Um, and here's another one that really concerns me. Um, you'll see the slide in the next one. This one's called Face to Gene. Um, and this one, as the quote says, but I'll read it for the translators, it takes advantage of the fact that so many genetic conditions have a telltale face. It is one of just several new technologies taking advantage of how quickly modern computers can analyze, sort, and find patterns against huge reams of data. And that's a quote from Wired. Um, here's an example. So we have a young girl with Down syndrome. Um, and in this case, it's being used to essentially identify that um, in an individual. And so I don't know exactly what this particular technology would be used for, but it's pioneered as a technology to increase quality of life for infants of children um, by being able to identify certain markers. But at the same time, these technologies are capturing images of children that can never be extricated from these systems, which are often interlinked with medical systems and other different databases. 
And so another thing that I think that we should be considering is um, what right do young people have? Uh, do they have the right to stay out of these systems in the first place? And often they don't. We think about that you know, when we have young children, whether we want to put their face on Facebook or on other websites, on the internet at all, but in these cases, um, because it's being sold as a public good or a medical good, we're not necessarily considering it the same way. And then of course I want to talk a little bit about algorithmic bias because I think that this is the biggest issue that I'm seeing and particularly, as I said, coming from the US, um, I'm going to get a little bit into the uses of these for law enforcement as well. So this is a great quote from Kate Crawford who does a lot of work on AI, much more than I do. Um, and she said that algorithms learn by being fed certain images, often chosen by engineers, and the system builds a model of the world based on those images. If a system is trained on photos of people who are overwhelmingly white, it will have a harder time recognizing non-white faces. And so functionally, what she's saying is that human bias, which we know exists, leads to machine bias. Or when AI codifies our identity in ways that replicate historical biases, we're being reduced to, to being seen as what and not who. And the most famous example of this that I could think of, or at least one of the most egregious, actually came from Google. This was an algorithm that Google Search was using that identified a photograph of a young black couple as gorillas. Um, so you know that when you go to Google Image Search now, they have all of these different categories. Some of the times where they get things wrong, it's kind of funny when it's like a, a, a dog as a cat or something like that. In this case, there was nothing funny about it. Now Google apologized for this, and it said that there is still clearly a lot of work to do with automatic image labeling, and we're looking at how we can prevent these types of mistakes from happening, happening in the future. But <laughs> as we know from a report that came out just this week, um, one thing that maybe is not part of Google's solution is actually just hiring more black people in the first place to ensure that these mistakes don't exist. Um, you can fill in the blank there because I think that this is true in a lot of these cases. A lot of times when we have these engineers or other individuals, humans in the loop who are training these systems, um, as I said, they're replicating real world biases that already exist and those biases come from their life experiences. And when we look at these Silicon Valley companies in particular or companies in mainland China, um, in both cases, they're not very diverse. Um, they don't have a lot of different people from different backgrounds working for them or training these different machine learning technologies. And so, as I said, I wanted to get into the law enforcement issue. So facial recognition in large crowds, we've heard a lot about instant crowd analysis, analysis of crowds over time, the capturing of trends. And really, this is a slippery slope of data protection because facial databases that are compiled by national level security services, along with their corporate partners in, in many cases, um, eventually make their way down to the municipal level. And so we've already seen problems with this in the US with predictive policing. Um, we know already in the US in particular, again, I'm gonna speak about my country because I know, I know the stats there. Um, when we look at, for example, the stop and frisk program in New York, which has been very controversial, um, we already know that it's disproportionately capturing young black men. Um, so this is where, if you're not familiar with the program, it's where police are essentially allowed to stop anyone on the street to stop them and frisk them. It's exactly what it sounds like, to, to shake them down and make sure that they're not carrying drugs or guns or other weapons. Um, but more often than not, police officers in New York are going after young black men and other people of color. Um, they're typically not going after me, and so I know that I'm safe walking down the street there. And so. If we already have that data being collected, if we already know that the data shows that uh, one group is being disproportionately targeted, then what does it mean when we take that data and we feed it into a machine learning system? Already the real world bias is captured and fed into that system. Um, and then of course, what about when you actually allow the technology to identify criminal activity or criminals? Um, in this case, we had a, a report from I'm not gonna be able to pronounce this shit. Um, Shanghai Zhao Tong University in China. I hope I did that one a little bit of justice. Um, so there are these two researchers who used a variety of machine vision algorithms to study faces of criminals and non-criminals. So again, these are already people who've been identified um, by, by humans, by police, as criminal or non-criminal, presumably through the justice system, um, and then tested to find out whether it could tell the difference. So their method's pretty straightforward. They take ID photos of, in this case, it was 1,856 Chinese men between the ages of 18 and 55 with no facial hair, and half of those men were 
criminals um, through the, you know, as I said. They then used 90% of those images to train a convolutional neural network to recognize the difference and then tested the neural network on the remaining 10% of the images. The results were actually rather unsettling. They found that the neural network could correctly identify criminals and non-criminals with an accuracy of 89.5%. So that's pretty high. Um, and they said that these, ah, lost the mouse, sorry. Oh, shoot. Help. Ah, there it is. They said that these highly consistent results are evidence for the validity of automatic face-induced interference on criminality, despite the historical controversy, controversy surrounding the topic. But when I heard that, I didn't hear 89.5%. Woohoo! I heard, what about the other 10.5%? Because what about those people? Can you imagine a criminal justice system where 10.5% of the individuals caught up in it are not guilty at all, but because it's a machine that we trust uh, that's identifying them as such, we allow that to happen. Um, what is an acceptable failure rate, I think is the question there, and what about those false positives, and what about due process? Um, is there a way to ensure that these are only being used in a preliminary way? I can't remember if I included this slide, so I'll just say it now, and forgive me if it comes up again. Uh, on the bus on the way here, it took about three hours, so I had plenty of time to read, um, and one of the, the articles that I read was actually about how Immigrations and Customs Enforcement in the US, which I'm sure everyone is familiar with at this point because it's in the news every single day, um, and let's abolish it. Uh, but ICE has been using um, this algorithm to determine whether or not people should be imprisoned when they cross the border illegally. So let me clarify this. The law does not state that people have to be imprisoned. The law actually states that crossing the border illegally is a misdemeanor, and not everyone needs to be imprisoned. Some people, um, if the algorithm were being used correctly, some people would be put into a queue for asylum processes. Other people would uh, you know, maybe be allowed to leave on their own recognizance. And then a smaller group of people, people with actual criminal records, would be imprisoned upon their entry. Um, but I see actually hacked that algorithm so that it would push everyone into the imprisonment category. I'm not kidding, this was news today uh, that I read, I think, on Boing Boing, but it was an AP article. It was a very like <laughs> um, accurate article. And I thought that that was really terrifying because when you put these systems into the hands of the wrong people, and again, ICE, which needs to be abolished, are the wrong people, um, that's what happens. And just another example of that from Georgetown Law Center uh, on Privacy and Technology, they put out a report last year called the Perpetual Lineup, which shows the way that un police recognition, or pol sorry, facial recognition is being used by police in unregulated ways. They found that law enforcement face recognition networks include over 117 million American adults. I believe that's not good at arithmetic, but I think that's close to half. And that major police departments are exploring facial recognition on live surveillance video that law enforcement face recognition is unregulated and, of course, in many cases, out of control, and, of course, that police facial recognition technologies disproportionately affect African Americans. And again, that's because of the way, often, that the bias already exists outside of the technology that's being fed into it and training machines in such a way. And I mentioned Kairos earlier. They're the ones that were building that, uh, one of the technologies that I think detects age and gender. Um, their CEO actually spoke out against this this week, and I was really happy to see that because I think that we have to have this kind of resistance sometimes coming from the companies themselves. Um, and he wrote this op-ed, I think, in Wired, where he argued that to be truly effective, algorithms that are powering facial recognition software require a massive amount of information. The more images of people of color it sees, the more likely it is to properly identify them. The problem is, though, that existing software has not been exposed to enough images of people of color to be confidently relied upon to identify them. And so he was arguing against the use of his and other similar technologies, such as those that Amazon uh, is already working with law enforcement in the US. That was the previous slide. They were out of order. Um, he was arguing against their use. And so we've already seen Amazon's technology, the recognition being used in Oregon and Florida in the US. Um, an interest in it is spreading. Microsoft has also recently um, been, you know, kind of come under controversy for working with law enforcement. Um, and I think Google as well with Project Maven working with the military in the US. But it's not just our faces 
Um, it's also our bodies, it's our tattoos. Um, this was a really interesting case um, that Netzpolitik did some work on. And so what we saw here was that this slide notes that tattoos are seen by the state as distinguishing marks for identification. Of course, we know that tattoos are often used by gangs in the US. This has been in the news a lot lately because of uh, Mara Salvatrucha or MS-13. Um, and they often tattoo their faces, so instantly recognizable. But then you also have other gangs using tattoos for similar purposes. You have prisons in certain countries where that's really common, uh, different prison markers. And so, of course, governments have an interest in identifying people and their affiliations by their tattoos. And so um, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is where this comes from, they, uh, my organization, EFF, has called them, uh, has called their, sorry, their program an ethically dubious research program to promote the development of automated tattoo recognition technology. And so what happened was that NIST and the FBI sponsored a tattoo recognition uh, technology challenge called TATC, providing research entities with more than 15,000 images operationally collected by law enforcement. So that's when people are arrested, their tattoos are photographed typically, or if they're in prison, um, and asked re researchers to run a series of trials using their proprietary tattoo analysis algorithms. The research demonstrated how technology could use tattoos to establish associations between subjects, thus, of course, violating our right to association. And then, of course, the permanent nature of tattoos, I'm guessing that I'm not the only person in this room who has some, uh, means that we can be seen as guilty by past association, that we can't change. To me, it's almost reminiscent of this idea of the right to be forgotten, that regardless of what we've done in the past, it can never escape us because we've marked it on our bodies. And of course, perhaps your parents, like mine, warned you about that, um, but I never imagined that it would be happening in this way. And even the way that we walk can tell law enforcement or other people something about who we are. This is additional data um, captured by companies and states that can be used to paint a picture of us. Um, and a person's gait, the way that they walk, can even be recognized from low quality CCTV footage. In one leading technique known as the gait energy image, computer vision techniques use video images of a person to create a blurred silhouette that is characteristic of their gait. And then a human operator links this gate signature to a person's identity, allowing the system to automatically spot that person when they're next caught on film. Excuse me, okay. And so I'm gonna sum this up to say that the machines have eyes, but they also have minds. And as more and more of these systems are becoming automated, humans will be increasingly placed outside of the loop. I gave the example earlier about stop and frisk. Um, this is something where humans are absolutely the ones doing the policing, doing the capturing, and creating the data that then serves the machines. But if we're trusting, or if we're using machines for that, we're inherently trusting the data that's being fed into them. And it's not always the same people who are creating the data that are training the systems or that are using the, um, using the systems. And so these systems are, of course, interconnected, um, but they're not always accountable to the end user, even if that, you know, if that end user is me, you, or law enforcement. And so as more and more image and video content is being created, the scale of processing gets smaller. Devices that are used to capture the world are processing the images of ourselves and others in real time. Um, is everyone familiar with the, um, facial recognition technology that's being piloted in Berlin at the moment. Yeah, Zudkreutz. Okay, so this is a really good example of this because that's actually, uh, as far as I understand it, it's being processed in real time. I'm not an expert on that one, so please, if I'm wrong, tell me after. And so I've been asking some questions throughout this. I think that we need to talk about who's training the systems and who's building them. We need to talk about the, the links between governments and corporations. We need to talk about these different systems um, uh, and the way that they're interlinked. And then of course we also need to talk about the way that the data is being used. But so what do we do? How do we safeguard, audit, and enforce responsible construction of identity when our personal data has been used to extrapolate inferences about us in real time? I'm worried about the future in this sense. Um, have, hasn't, did you, do you know what this is from? Yeah, exactly. So um, has anyone heard of Sesame Credit? Yeah, this is also coming from China. So this is a social credit scoring system being developed by Ant Financial. I, I mentioned them earlier. They're partnering with one of the companies. I can't remember which one now. Uh, Megvi, I think. Um, so Ant Financial is an affiliate of Alibaba, which I think a lot of people have heard of. 
and associate of the Chinese government. And it uses data from Alibaba's services to compile this score. So essentially, this is a social credit score that um, has kind of been described as, or sorry, it combines services that have been described as like the equivalents of Twitter and Facebook in China, and then another service that's been described as the equivalent of Amazon and eBay. So imagine all of those things that you use, whether you're using it to buy things, to communicate with your friends, to participate in groups or protests or events or whatever, taking all of that, taking all of that data about your behavior, mushing it together, and then having it be used to rank you um, based on different factors like loyalty to your government, loyalty to brands, um, loyalty to, you know, whatever. And so the rewards of having a high score include things like easier access to loans or jobs, um, priority during bureaucratic paperwork. I would love that one, personally, uh, the ability to cut the queue. <laughs> but then you've got the negative consequences. So we've already seen some about um, uh, being denied service to certain transportation. But now there's also things like uh, lower internet speeds, being denied access to job offers, loans, bureaucratic paperwork. So again, if you're great, then you're on this good side. You know, you get all of this stuff faster and better. Um, but if you are not loyal to brands or to your government, we'll put you in this category. Um, and to me, this really, I, it reminds me of an episode of Black Mirror. I'm not sure if everyone watches that, but we've already seen the kind of dystopia that this could exist in through fiction. Uh, the system has been labeled as a mass surveillance tool and a mass disciplinary machine by organizations that specialize in human rights. And then what about the end of anonymity? Are we getting there as well? So cash no longer equals privacy when you've got a video at the point of sale. So we used to joke at, um, at my organization, we probably still joke about this, that you know, if you want to buy a burner phone, you know, the kind of phone that you use a couple times, throw away, um, that you probably should do it on Halloween because then you can wear a costume and you won't get captured by the camera that's behind the counter. Um, so yeah, do that. You know, do it on a night where it's safe to wear a costume and wherever you live. Um, but... <laughs> On every other day of the year, you don't necessarily have the kind of privacy that you might have had in the past by using cash instead of credit because of the way that cameras and facial recognition is used. And so I think what we're coming into is a future dystopia. Um, it's not just cameras, it's all of this data. Like I said at the very beginning, we have the data that you willingly give over to companies like Facebook or Twitter, congratulations if you're not on them, I couldn't survive with my job. Um, but also the data that's being captured of you incidentally, and then the data that you're giving up through new tools like Google Home and Amazon's Alexa, um, and all of these other things that make our lives easier. I do not have those, <laughs> um, and I won't shame you if you do, but I would take some caution here. So this great quote, again, I'll just read it for the translators. In the future, fine faces designers imagine a world where people walking past you on the street could find your social network profile by sneaking a photograph of you, and shops, advertisers, and the police could pick your face out of crowds and tra track you down via social networks. And so moving to my conclusion here, I want to say that digital images are not static. With each new development, each new sweep of a new algorithm, they're reassessed. What you share today may mean something else tomorrow. And there's no universal reasonable, ex ex oh, sorry, no universal reasonable expectation between us and our technology. The consequence of data aggregation is that increased capture of, your per of our personal information results in a more robust, yet distorted, because of these biases, picture of who we are like the film. And lastly, this emergent social contract that's being forged between ourselves and our technology is operating under asymmetric pre pretenses. We can't see behind the curtain. We don't know how the collection of our visual imagery is being used, aggregated, or repurposed, and by what actors. These technologies are mechanisms of control, so we have to ask what kind of a world we want. We've seen how bias in algorithms works. We've seen how these machines are being trained. And we know that bias is inextricably tied to these technologies. So, to conclude, because I think I've been looking at the wrong time on the screen, I think I'm actually going over at this point. Um, what do we want? Well, this is what I think we want. I mean, ultimately, I think that we need to be asking, you know, what kind of world do we want to live in? And personally, I want to live in a world that doesn't have these ubiquitous cameras. But I have to be a little bit more pragmatic than that. So first, I would say an active life free from passive surveillance, control over our choices and over the images that we share, and a technology market that isn't based on selling us out to the highest bidder. And so what can we do to regulate that world? Well, 
I would say develop a global set of best practices, which is difficult because a lot of governments are already far ahead in creating this kind of dystopian world. Um, I think that we need to create municipal regulations to govern surveillance tech locally, Ex have external review boards to challenge the use of these technologies in every form, and of course, higher levels of scrutiny over mergers and acquisitions of databases. And finally, I think that we need to create better privacy standards for technology so we can segment privacy by feature, for example, location, visual representation, search, social, and movement. Create user-centric privacy controls that favor you and not the company or the government, as the case may be. And forward consent, which is something that I think about all the time because I think that that's really what we're lacking in this particular moment with the consumer technologies, um, let alone the ones that are being used by governments. Um, I could give a couple examples, but like I said, running out of time, happy to answer questions though after. And so in order to live or love out loud, um, I think there are a few other things that we can do other than just you know, petitioning our, um, our legislators to create those things. One is I think we can create photo awareness, make people aware of the different ways. I mean, I don't know if any of you notice the cameras around you. Luckily, there aren't any here unless they're on people's phones. But every day when I walk through cities, I think about it. Um, and Berlin is really nice for this. I have to say, like, there are not that many. They're not everywhere. Um, but walk through London for a few minutes and you'll see just how ubiquitous they are. And the US is really becoming that way as well. I think we need to regulate our own spaces. So. Again, that's the beauty of this space. It's the beauty of clubs in Berlin where the stickers are put over every phone. I love that so very much. Um, it makes me feel safe to not have cameras, which is the exact opposite of what governments are saying. And so I think we need to think about things like that. Put static in the system. Um, you can fuck with the data, why not? And then continue to love out loud, to not live in fear, to continue to put ourselves out there um, and to not quiet ourselves just because of this, the way that this data is being captured. And so with that, um, I think I went significantly over time somehow. I was afraid of coming up too short. Uh, so thank you, that's me. You can find me I mean, after the weekend, of course. Um, and I'm here if people have questions. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, Jalen. Um, I'm gonna think about you every time I'm gonna buy something and I see a camera. You gotta do it with a, with a costume on. Um, does anyone would like to comment or have a question? We still have a couple of minutes and we can take something. Would you like to ask? <laughs> um, do you know in London uh, how long will they preserve the, the data of the cameras? I do not. I'm sorry. Um, I'd be happy to, to look. I'd be happy to look into that though, but I, I, yeah, I don't know off the top of my head. I think um, there should be a human right like of um, destroyal of your data after 24 hours, wherever you have been. Yeah, oh, I absolutely agree with that. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about the case in London. I mean, I know that there are a lot of private companies that are doing this. Um, I'm not, uh, so honestly, I'm not really an expert on uh, privacy laws. And so I, I have to say that, you know, I've been looking into these technologies and the way that they're being used, but I'm thinking about this more on a social level than um, on a legal level, but I, I would absolutely agree with that proposition. So the only chance is like uh, doing like legal things, like uh, playing volleyball outside on spaces and distract <laughs> the cameras and then doing other stuff where you have not been seen? Um, yeah, I mean, I can't recommend doing illegal things. Well, I probably could, but this is being taped, so I won't. Um, I can't recommend anything illegal, but, uh, you know, I mean, there are things that are not illegal. Um, and one of those, for example, is um, there's clothing and makeup and other things that are being developed that can kind of deflect cameras. A lot of them are based on flash technology, so they're intended to, like, if somebody takes a flash photograph of you, to deflect the flash. Um, so that's not really functional when it comes to CCTV cameras. But at the same time, um, I think that we should be fighting for the ability, and I, I don't, again, I don't know the laws in this case, but the ability to cover our faces. Um, I'm not in favor of some of the European countries that have banned women from covering their faces, because I think that, that, I mean, A, free expression, but B, also, I think that it impacts our right to do the exact same thing if we want to. Um, how good is the system working, um, like if you are um, wearing something like over your head, um, like costumes and stuff, and like eye recognition? Yeah, so I mean, I didn't talk about eye recognition because I, I don't know as much about it, to be honest. Um, 
I would say that it's pretty safe to say that it's not yet being employed in a lot of the same places that uh, cameras are. And so in some cases, you know, it would certainly, like the their cameras are reliant on being able to triangulate a bunch of different features about you rather than just your eyes. But obviously technology is changing really rapidly. And so that may not be true for very long. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think there were pretty specific questions about long. Are you yeah, planning something? I can only something? answer about 50% of them, but <laughs> they were good questions. OK. Um, in this case, I would like to thank you, Julian, for the great um, talk. And then thank you all, um, the audience, for being so great as well. And see you in a bit with relativity theory. So for beginners, I don't know if you like it or not, but thank you, Julian, again.